As humans, we all have basic needs. Of these needs, stable access to food supply is essential for survival and the prosperity of our world. The Committee for World Food Security defines food and nutrition security as all people having access to sufficient and nutritious food, which meets their preferences and dietary needs. My name is Arjun Pripti and I'll be talking to you about the global food insecurity caused by the pandemic. And I'm Christian Bachmans, and I'll be talking to you about the sources and solutions to higher food prices. In the first part of the presentation, we'll see how food insecurity measured by the prevalence of undernourished varies with changes in GDP per capita, food inflation, and social safety and spending. In the second part, we'll see what drives food inflation. The global economic crisis induced by the pandemic could raise decades of progress towards the achievement of Sustainable Development Goal No. 2 of the United Nations, also known as Zero Hunger by 2030. But why is fighting undernourishment important? First, undernourishment can hinder the accumulation of human capital and limit the country's growth potential in the long run. Second, it can pose a threat to social stability in the short run. Here's what happens. People lose their income and their jobs during the recession. Many have to cut down on food expenditure, which may result in undernourishment and hunger, and in some cases, even in famine. Using global data on the last two decades, we found that for every 1% reduction in GDP per capita during the recession, there is a 1% increase in the share of undernourished on a global scale. The second most important factor is food prices. We found that food inflation drives up undernourishment, but the effects are five times smaller than those of income, making income changes by far the largest driver of hunger. However, average income is not all that matters. The way income is distributed in a country makes a difference, which is why we looked also into the effect of redistributive measures like social protection. These are programs that supplement people's income during unemployment, illness, or other financial hardships. What we discovered in our analysis was that an increase in social protection expenditure by 1% has an effect on undernourishment of around the same magnitude as food inflation. It reduces undernourishment by 0.2%, making the increase in safety net spending just enough to counterbalance the increase in food prices. What can governments do? Expanding safety nets in the short term and putting economies on an inclusive growth trajectory can restart the process of eliminating global undernourishment. As my colleague Irvin just explained, food price inflation can increase food insecurity. Now, you may have noticed that lately your groceries at the local supermarket have become more expensive. You're not the only one. Our data analysis shows that food inflation has recently increased in many countries around the world. But why are food prices increased? And what can we do about it? So what are the sources of food inflation? Using a global data set on the last two decades, we were able to identify a number of major determinants that influence the prices of your groceries. First of all, prices of raw, unprocessed food commodities such as wheat, corn and soybeans that are traded extensively on world markets are an important factor. These commodities are shipped in bulk all across the world in big container ships. We found that if, due to forces of global demand and supply, prices of world food commodities increase by 10%, then prices in supermarkets increase on average by only 2%. This pass-through from world food inflation to domestic food inflation is incomplete because taxes, subsidies, price controls, weak market integration and distribution costs all hinder the transmission of international price variations across borders. Second, some emerging markets have recently experienced steep currency depreciations. Now, this is problematic because most food commodities are traded and paid for in US dollars. A currency depreciation weakens a country's purchasing power. And if the country is a net food importer, this tends to raise food prices in grocery stores. Third, agricultural production fluctuates with the weather. Because weather is so unpredictable and varies from year to year, in some years the harvest will be good and in other years it will be disappointing. This is particularly relevant for countries with small crop areas. And these disappointing harvests are likely to become more frequent with climate change. We found that a typical negative domestic food supply shock today increases domestic food prices by 0.3 percentage points, a sizable effect. A typical regional food supply shock is even more important and raises domestic food prices by 0.7 percentage points. Now we know some factors that influence food prices, how can policymakers control food price inflation? First of all, 
free trade can function as a hedge against domestic food supply shocks. This is because if harvests are disappointing in one country because of bad weather, it's very likely that there are other countries somewhere in the world where the harvest is better than usual. Second, countries should make sure they jointly invest in adequate buffer stock reserves that can act as an insurance against negative global food supply shocks. Third, promoting currency stability. And fourth, developing climate resilient agricultural production systems will also help. Finally, policymakers should try to avoid, as much as they can, the use of trade barriers to stabilize domestic food prices. While such policies may work if they are pursued by no more than a handful of countries, these policies quickly become self-defeating if other countries also impose such barriers.